Welcome everyone, my name is Kate Everts and I'm a third class here at the Academy and I'm going to be the facilitator for this um, event. So uh, Dr. Ruth, you grew up in Germany right before the start of World War II. How did your life change after the rise of Nazism? So first of all, I was born in 1928. I'm going to be 90 this coming June. And maybe I'll invite all of you for the party. <laughs> so the first years of my life were wonderful. I was in a loving family with a mother, grandmother, uh, and a father who had, the grandmother had nothing else to do but take care of me. My mother helped my father in his uh, business. I went to a Jewish school. I was an Orthodox uh, a Jewish uh, school, and I had, I was short. Uh, I was always short. Uh, <laughs> There was a, a physician in first class who said, I couldn't be in class because I'm so short. And I fast did the multiplication table and talked very fast, and he let me be in school. So until uh, 1938, uh, I, I really had a wonderful early socialization, which I'll talk to you about in a little while. Uh, when the Nazis came to power, the German Jews, my parents, grandparents, who had a farm not far from Frankfurt, thought that this would be just a short period of time of upheaval and it would pass. They did not realize what evil can do. So uh, the night of, uh, it's called Kristallnacht, I call it the night of broken glass, when the synagogues were burned, and the Jewish stores were looted. Uh, somebody told my father on the way to synagogue, I was with him, Julius, that was his name, we ha you have to leave. There are going to be terrible things happening. And my father said, no, nothing is going to happen tomorrow. It's a holiday, it's a Catholic holiday, Himmelfahrt. That morning, the Nazis walked into the apartment there was no hitting, but I do remember the big black boots. They told my father to get dressed. They said he has to go with him. My grandmother had a long skirt, and in those days, she even had some money sewn into the skirt and gave it to the Nazi and said, take good care of my son. I do remember my father going outside the building turning around before he stepped up on a truck, uh, waving to me with a little smile. That was the last I ever saw of my father. So the clouds of Nazism, they did not, the German Jews loved Germany. They fought in World War I with Germany. They didn't realize what was happening. Uh, a postcard came. My father was then taken to a camp a labor camp was not a concentration camp yet. A postcard <coughs> came that I have a space on a, with a group of children to go to Switzerland. And my father said, I have to go so that he can come back from labor camp to Frankfurt. I had no choice. I didn't want to leave. I had 13 dolls. I had roller skates. How old I, were you at that time? Ten, ten, ten and a half. So I had no choice. My mother and grandmother brought me to the railroad station in Frankfurt. That was the last I ever saw of them. I then went to Switzerland to a children's home that became an orphanage and uh, for all of us. And I did a longitudinal study of those children who were with me. And the important thing for people like you in the academia here, the early socialization the early years of a child. I was 10, the others who were with me were from about six to 14. The early socialization is crucial. That's why people like myself survived and survived psychologically. You said, you talked a little bit about uh, schooling. Um, you took great pride in education, but you, instead of getting your high school diploma, you got a um, diploma of a housemaid. From Swiss, yes, Swiss housemaid's <laughs> diploma. So 
like you, which we saw before, when women were not accepted in the academia. So um, in the Swiss boarding home, we had one teacher for 40 children of different intellectual and different ages, boys and girls, and only the boys could go to the village high school. The girls were trained, I was trained to be a Swiss housemaid. So if I'm not Dr. Ruth anymore, I can go to your general who just spoke and I can show my diploma and I will say, I don't do windows. <laughs> <laughs> so what they did is they discriminated, this is important for you and for your discussions, uh, that only the boys could go to school. I already grew up in Frankfurt with that notion how education is important. I do remember my family telling me, education nobody can take from you. So I was very sad that I couldn't go. I don't have a high school diploma. Don't tell anybody. I have a doctorate and I have a few honorary that's, that's doctorates. That's better, I think. But I don't have a high school diploma, but I have the diploma that you are talking about of a Swiss housemaid. Is that what you did after the war then, or what did you do after the war? So, in 1945, for you people, first of all, bravo in the profession that you are entering. You are not entering Wall Street yet, only after you <laughs> retire. So, um, I want to say that in sociology there's a term that's called significant others. That's what you are all going to be. So, the um, education, was always instilled in me as being very, very important. I did not realize, uh, in, only in Switzerland, that girls could not go to high school. Right, first of all, loud and clear people, if the Allied had not entered World War II, and I do remember your Air Force bombarding Germany because I could see it from Switzerland. So if you had not entered World War II, I would not be alive, because Hitler would have taken Switzerland also. So right after the war, since I knew, and I still believe very much, every country, every person needs a country of their own. I do believe that Jews who did not have a country of their own needed a country of their own, and I went with the first opportunity, I went to then Palestine. I was a member of the Haganah, that was the forerunner before the IDF, before the Israel Defense Forces, and I was trained as a sniper. Kate, watch out what you're going to ask me. I can still put bullets, five bullets, into that red circle. I don't do it it's anymore. Impressive. Not since <laughs> Columbine. I know how to put a stem gun together with my eyes closed. You want to teach me? No, nope. I'm not doing it anymore since Columbine. I let you people do it. However, I do, I did, it wasn't an act of heroism on my part. Everybody in then Palestine that was occupied by the British, but it was already clear that the British in 1945, after the war, that eventually they will have to do something. I don't talk about politics. Somebody who talks about that other subject that I'm known for so much has to stay away from politics. But I certainly entered the Haganah, the underground. I was very well trained. And I was not, it, it wasn't a long time that I was there because I was badly wounded uh, from a cannonball that entered the residence of the girls that I was living in, in Jerusalem, and killed two girls next to me, and wounded me badly on my two legs. That's not why I'm short. I would have been short anyway. <laughs> However, I was badly wounded, so that was the end of my military service. I was then brought into a hospital in Jerusalem, and I know that what you're going to ask me, it's the true story. I was brought to the Hadassah Hospital that was in Jerusalem, and I was, since I'm so short, they didn't have any more beds. Only guys 
there were many, many soldiers wounded. And since I'm so short, look, four foot seven, I'm so short, they put me in the library where they had made a room for the soldiers, they put me on a shelf. On a shelf? Because, on a shelf, on a, on a bookshelf. Because, and I didn't mind because the whole room was full of men. <laughs> and the, the morale was excellent, even so the men were badly wounded. One lost both hands with a hand grenade, another one was blind. Um, but the morale was good, we sang, and I do remember that I played chess with them. Then came a lady, a woman nurse. I will never forget her. She said, a woman, a girl, can't be in the room with men. That was pretty stupid because there was nothing that I could have done on that shelf. <laughs> so they put me upstairs with women who were really sick. And uh, luckily, I was able to go back to the residence and do therapy to that residence of girls. And now, there was a brilliant physician. I was able to be a, a black diamond skier my whole life, not anymore. I just gave it up. And I could dance a whole night if I found a good partner. Good partner is important. <laughs> now, can you tell us a little bit about working in the kibbutz? Yes. And then what exactly that is? OK. So when I came to then Palestine, I left with the first ship that left Europe after you, Allied, won the war. I went to then Palestine. Palestine was occupied by the British. And I knew that we had to build a country. That's where your discussion on ethics and morality comes in. I knew that we had to build a country for Jews so that every person in this world has a country to go to. And uh, so I went on a kibbutz. A kibbutz is a collective uh, farm where everybody works together. And it's a little bit that you get what you need and you have to work to your ability. I thought I'll be my whole life on a kibbutz. But after a year, I didn't like so much that they could decide all of the decisions. So I went to, I, want, I really wanted to study medicine. No high school diploma, no parents, no money. Impossible to study medicine. I said, OK, I'll be a kindergarten teacher. I remember my grandmother saying, you should be a kindergarten teacher. You are so short, you can sit on those little chairs. So I said, I'll be a kindergarten teacher. That's what I did in then, when Israel became Israel. I thought I would always live there. Luckily for me, I married. First, I thought I'm so short, no man would marry me. I have to tell you, I was married three times. <laughs> the last one was the real marriage. The other ones were legalized love affairs. <laughs> but I, with one legalized love affair, I went to Paris and uh, ran a kindergarten. And now I was a kindergarten teacher, and went to the Sorbonne. And I was fortunate. After World War II, there was a law that anybody who could pass an année préparatoire, a preparation year, could enter the Sorbonne, even without a high school diploma. I studied hard, and I know that you would like to study French. And I was able, now the Sorbonne, after World War II, there were so many soldiers and immigrants and French people, there was very little space in the auditorium. Fortunately that I was so short, I went right in front where the professor was, and there was a window seal. I took a good looking man, and I said, put me up on the window seal. That's how I did all my studies. That seems like the <laughs> best place to study for me. Um, now, you talked a little bit about in the kibbutz, a tight-knit group and how everybody worked together. Yeah. How important is it for, um, especially like in the military today, like to work as a tight-knit family and team? Very important. Because what you are doing in your teams is to give each person respect. I want to tell you that I was, <clears throat> for many years, on a committee of the New York City police talking about issues of respect with the community. And the teamwork is crucial because this way you give each other support. 
And this way you know that you're not alone in that. And it radiates to the people in the community that you are working with. So um, I have tremendous respect. If you, Allied, had not entered World War II, I told you I wouldn't be alive. So uh, for me to be here is wonderful. I also taught at West Point, I taught officers about family life and that other subject that I'm not talking about today here. <laughs> so um, very important because what you are projecting is this kind of, by team working, this kind of that you're doing this together that will have an effect on the people that you're working with. And you talked about respect and someone who, yourself being shorter than the average height, did you think that people who are shorter get less respect or what do you have to say to that? I tell you that I thought that somebody so short like me would never be able to get a good man. So I was married three times, I told you. The, the real marriage was with Fred Westheimer, who actually entered the army after World War II to interrogate Nazis because he spoke German very well. So I have a little bit of that connection. I think that the issue of being so short uh, has, you have to be, you have to talk loud so that you can be heard. And I think that you can try to make the best of it. I try to make the best of it even today by taking like Josh or somebody and say, carry my bag. <laughs> so try to make the best of it. But in your discussions, no question that short people, people of different religious beliefs, uh, people heavier maybe, uh, do deserve respect. I agree. Um, now, when you first came to America, you sailed into New York. What did you think when you first came to New York? Oh boy. First of all, don't tell anybody, but I came with then husband number two on fourth class. They told us you cannot come up on deck. I didn't listen. When we sailed into New York, we sneaked up at that night and stayed up on a terrace to watch that Statue of Liberty. I do remember the feeling of how wonderful. Here is the statue that says all of you refugees, regardless from your background, regardless what religion, you are welcome. You all know that Emma Lazarus poem that's on the Statue of Liberty. I will never forget, now I'm a member of the Museum of Jewish Heritage a living memorial to the Holocaust. We have a program that sends cadets, also from here, to Auschwitz to learn about ethical issues, all of those things that you are talking about, and uh, who do a study, and then we have a dinner, and they report back. It's a life-changing experience, and I know that there are also people from your academy that, that go there, uh, because what it does, it keeps that memory alive. And I have to show you something. I did a book that just came out. It's a graphic novel for children. It's called Rollercoaster Grammar. The first pages are my experience as a child in Germany that I just discussed. The other pages in color are my taking two of my four grandchildren. When I show a picture of my four grandchildren, I always say, Hitler lost and I won. I take two of my grandchildren to an amusement park. We get measured. They can go on the right and I'm too short. That's your answer about too short. <laughs> um, now, when you first came to America, you worked as a housekeeper and you yes. only earned one dollar an hour. Yes. That's much different now. Very different now. <laughs> so I, when I came here, I came actually to a, on a visitor's visa. Then I found an ad in a German Jewish newspaper in New York that the new school for social research, the graduate faculty uh, that was created for immigrants, for professors who couldn't teach in Europe anymore, Jews and non-Jews, communists, everybody, they had a scholarship. So I went and applied. 
I thought, if I'm here already, now I have already studied psychology at the Sorbonne, let me pick up a master's. I spoke very little English, but the professors there spoke some German and some French. And very little Hebrew, but I spoke already Hebrew, French, and German. I got the scholarship. Today, talking about ethics, today there is a Ruth Westheimer scholarship paying tuition for three students. And then I went to uh, Columbia University's Teachers College, got my doctorate, and there's another scholarship for a doctoral student in my name. So that has to do with paying back and being grateful. So I was very fortunate. I got a, a master's in sociology, and um, that's why I can uh, teach so well. And I got a doctorate in the study of the family. And today, almost 90, I told you, I'm teaching at Columbia my fourth year. I taught six years now at Yale and Princeton. Now I'm teaching my third year Columbia Teachers College. And they just told me I'm going to teach again next year. Fair I'm nice. teaching a seminar on the family as depicted in the media. And we talk a lot about values and we talk a lot about respect because we are, we are seeing different families. We are now seeing Spanish movies with families. We are seeing homosexual, heterosexual, uh, all kind of different uh, issues. So it's a wonderful class. And I did ask your general to come to my class to give a talk because he's such a good talker. And I told him he has to come for free. He said yes. So, <laughs> I want to say something when, when I talk about ethics. I did another children's book. All three books are yours, and you can share it with them. Leopold, oh. I believe, and I have a whole collection. Don't give me any more, because I have a lot of them. Turtles. A turtle, if it stays in one place, it's safe. Nothing can happen to that turtle. If that turtle wants to move, it has to take a risk. That's what all of you are doing. It has to stick its neck out. It could get hurt, but without sticking its neck out, it can't move. So that's yours. I like that. Thank you. Welcome. Then the other one that's yours also is the doctor is in. And you have to share it with it's all of us. It's got a nice them. picture of her on the front. Right. <laughs> um, you, when you first moved to New York, you moved to Washington Heights, and right. you still live there. Yeah. I'm, I never moved to Fifth Avenue or Park Avenue even when I did a lot of television, and there's a new television show, maybe, on the horizon. Ooh. And right now, they're doing a documentary about me, which you will see after my birthday. We will put a little bit of this in it, too. So, Washington Heights, very interesting for you in terms of ethics and morality and people feeling better. Washington Heights is high up. It's the tip end of Manhattan and it's very European. So the European immigrants who came to this country felt very good. It was cheap rent, and it was where the cloisters is, which is part of the Museum of, um, of Art, uh, but, um, the Metropolitan Museum, and it has a, f uh, a European flavor. So I first took a furnished room, then a rented apartment, and then when it became uh, co-op. I'm now still living in Washington Heights. Out of my window, I can see the George Washington Bridge. You can come to visit. And the Tappan Sea Bridge. And it's a wonderful neighborhood. Very nice. So I feel that I still have the roots in my European background, despite having been... Uh, I want to tell you that there was a conference in Evian that has something to do with all of what you are learning. In 1938, they said, let's save Roosevelt, send an emissary and other free countries, because they saw the clouds on the horizon. They said, let's save German Jewry. Nothing happened, except a cry came out from that conference. Let's at least save the children. England took 10,000 Jewish children in 1938, 39, to England, they were saved. Holland, Belgium, France, and Switzerland each took 300. 
the children who went to Holland, Belgium, and France did not survive because Hitler, the Nazis, took those countries. The children in Switzerland, if I had not been with that group in Switzerland, I would not be alive. So you can imagine how grateful I am that you people invite me to this important institution and how grateful I am to Switzerland for having had me, despite the fact that they made me a housemaid and didn't let me go to high school, I'm still grateful. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to talk a little bit about your um, later career in psychology and everything. Yes. You had your first um, introduction to sexology through Planned Parenthood. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I can't talk the word S-E-X. I can only spell it out. You can think about it. First of all, anybody, anybody who goes to a career like you and who works hard, I promise you, good, spell it out for the rest of your life. So uh, I, did, I did my doctoral dissertation. Uh, I did first a study, a longitudinal study that I told you about the children who were saved and saw the importance of early childhood. My doctoral dissertation I did uh, for plant parenthood. I trained para professionals, black and Puerto Rican women. That's where that word respect comes in. Because in those years, many years ago, they were not, they didn't have high school diplomas. The uh, women that I trained to be family planning counselors, they all went for their high school diploma at the same time. They got better jobs afterwards in the city health department. And I realized how important it is that people can make choices. And that's what I, my entire life, uh, talked about. Then I became a therapist in that area of my expertise. And uh, I did a radio program. Yeah, how did you find yourself talking on the radio about said subject? Your parents knew me from the radio because I did that radio program about that subject for 10 years. Every Sunday night from 10 to 12, I said, people, give me questions like we do later. Give me questions, no names. Just say, a friend of mine has a question. And I was very well trained. I went. I was uh, six years at Cornell Medical School, uh, not to be a medical doctor, but to be a psychosexual therapist. So I was very well trained. And uh, fortunate, I did afterwards 400 television shows on cable, when cable was just starting. And um, a, 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 a wonderful career, but I've never forgotten. The, the, that's part of that topic of that you are discussing, I have never forgotten to be thankful that I'm alive and I have never forgotten the importance of education because nobody can take that away from you. Of course. Um, also, you're approaching your 90th birthday as you talked about. Um, do you feel that people of older age get pushed to the sidelines in any field? And how do you feel about that? Yes, it's very sad in this country, but we are changing it. We are. All of us here, because in this country, somehow they thought that over 50 is over the hill. I'm telling older people, I'm not saying don't retire. I don't retire. But I don't tell them not to retire. Tell all of your parents and grandparents to rewire meaning do something else. Once you finished with your job and you are going to be uh, in a pension, do something else. Help other people in the community. That will keep you alive and that will keep you interested in what's around you. Now you talked about these three books. Now do you have any other books that you want to talk about that you've written? Because I think you've written 40 some books. Yes. I have one book that I want to tell you that just came out. It's called Stay or go. Important for you military people because you have long, long distance relationships, very many of you. You are very fortunate because these days you have long distance relationships but you can see each other with your phones and on the computer. In previous years it was more difficult. It's still difficult to keep a long distance relationship. 
So sometimes people are in a relationship that's not productive. And I have that book that's called Stay or Go to make, let people make the decision. Uh, for my Twitter, I have like 90,000 90, people on the Twitter. It's Impressive. called Ask Dr. Ruth. So I say make the decision if sometimes if a relationship is not good, if it really has more tears than laughter, if you can't have discussions, then maybe you have to end it. I want to say another word of warning, of what worries me these days about young people. What worries me is that everybody has that iPhone. Not right now, they're all listening to us. And I'm very worried that the art of conversation is going to get lost. And not only that, young people are going to develop some physical ailments because they're constantly looking the, down. You know. Right. So put that iPhone away when you have dinner with somebody who has something to say. That's very good advice. Good advice. Okay. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. If we have microphones out in the aisles, if you guys have questions, um, feel free I to ask Dr. Ruth anything. Right. Say, a friend of mine has a question. <laughs> Where's the microphone? They're in the aisleways right down okay. here. Oh, that's much better. I can see you. Can I tell you one more story while you do that? Um, many, many years ago, there were uh, American and Israeli people in Israel manning the Patriots. And I had called the Pentagon and said I would like to say thank you for the people who are doing that, and can I please go up on the base. So they told me to call the embassy. I called the embassy. They said, we just decided no more civilians on the base. It interferes with their work. I don't take a no for an answer. I went to the base. I left the gas mask at the time. Everybody had to wear a gas mask in the taxi. I, down the road came an American general who was stationed in Germany. And he said, Dr. Roth, what are you doing here? I said, I want to go up and say thank you. And the general said to his driver, do we have time? The driver said, for Dr. Roth, of course. I went up, I took a microphone, and I said, today I'm not talking about those things that I usually talk about. I got booed <laughs> by hundreds of Americans and hundreds of Israelis. And I said, today I came here to say thank you for what you are doing. But then I said, I promise you, when this is over, when you are going to go back home, I promise you the best, that term that I'm not saying, all of you know, ever. And I met one of them at the, at the bookstore at the Pentagon in those years, and I gave him the book Sex for Dummies for free. And because he was at, the, at, the, at that event. So you can, you can ask some questions even about that topic without being very direct. If you see me outside walking with Kate or Josh, you can ask me the questions directly. OK, looks like we have a question. Yes. about that topic, but <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. I'm enjoying your presentation so much. Um, I would love to hear more about the longitudinal study that you did on the children that you were with mm -hmm. in the orphanage. Yes. So what I did is I was able to find most of them, of course, and I did a questionnaire to those who I couldn't interview, and I interviewed the ones that I could. And this is why I can say loud and clear that the, they all were home the first six years in their families before they went to uh, Switzerland, before they went to the home that became an orphanage. The first years of a child, the, the first years of socialization is crucial. And that's what I, I was a kindergarten teacher, so I used that, but I used that also by saying how important it is that we take care of that next uh, generation. Because none of them committed suicide, none of them became mentally unstable, and that was definitely before, because of the first years 
being in a loving, caring family, despite the horrors of the Nazi and what happened then. And loud and clear, I have to repeat that, that if you, if the Americans, had not entered World War II, I would not be alive. So there is something like this in terms of morality, in terms of uh, ethics and beliefs that's very, very important for me. Thank you. Can I have another one? I need one guy, otherwise I go back and I say only women ask questions. <laughs> Attention. Um, so I just, I had a question. Um, you obviously have talked a lot about the importance of the early socialization of children. I was just wondering, what are uh, maybe your biggest concerns for children who are growing up in war times now, like in Syria and Yemen, where they're seeing all this destruction, having family members killed? Um, what are your biggest concerns for them? And how maybe can we help them um, achieve better socialization so that they can have better psychological well-being? I think that it's very sad. I'm really saddened by what happens. And it doesn't matter if these are refugees who are Jewish from, from the ones that I described from Nazi Germany or what is happening right now. It's very sad that in a society like ours and in a civilized society and in a society where people like you have made that decision to give your energy, your life, your time, to help others, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Very, very sad, and I feel very sad. Now, somebody like me, I vote every year. I have never not voted since I became an American citizen, but I do not do politics, because somebody who talks about that other subject so much like me should not talk about politics. But there is no question that I'm very saddened when I see the pictures of the uh, children who have to endure things that we would never have thought that that would happen in the year 2018. Yeah. Is it working? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. First of all, thank you so much. You're such an inspiration, and we thank you for everything that you've done and coming to talk to us and everything. Uh, something that was going through my mind, um, if you could go back to your younger self before, like the night of the broken glass and everything, give yourself some advice and talk to, them, talk to yourself, what would you say? Mm -hmm. First of all, boy, you listen carefully. You even know that I call it broken glass and not crystal, because crystal implies beautiful chandeliers. And it's hard to so, say. Right. So what I would say... <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what I would say is the importance of making the best out of every time that you have with your family. That's really the main thought that comes to my mind. Now, for me it was fortunate that I grew up in a household, in an Orthodox Jewish believing household, so I did know about uh, the Jewish tradition. I also knew that in the Jewish tradition it says a lesson taught with humor is a lesson retained. I use that all the time. I don't tell you jokes. I couldn't tell you a joke. I don't remember them. They go in one ear out the other. But what I would say, uh, looking back, I would say, fortunately, that I had that wonderful 10-year experience. And the other thought that comes to my mind, which is of interest for a discussion, that actually my parents gave me life a second time by sending me to safety to Switzerland, not knowing if they would ever see me again. They hoped that this would be over and they would pick me up and we would go to a country that would take us. There was no Israel yet. And that's why I go, I go to Israel every single year. I do some television there, I talk about the subject that you know me about. And um, I did not know that I would not live there. But I have to say, what has happened to me, becoming Dr. Ruth, could only have happened in, in, in the United States and only in New York. I'll tell you a fast story. Uh, there is a woman, Deborah Jo Rupp. She's the actress who played in the 70s show. 
And there is a play about me called Becoming Dr. Ruth. When I came to this country, they said, if you want to teach here, you have to take speech lessons to lose your accent. I never had money for speech lessons. Guess what? Deborah Jo Rapp, who played me in the Berkshires and in New York, she had to take a speech coach to learn my accent. <laughs> so if I could go back and say, what, what could I have changed? The accent I would not change. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much for sharing the wealth and richness of your experiences. As a refugee yourself, do you have any suggestions for how we can make our community more welcoming for refugees coming into this country today? Okay. Can I brag a little about something? My son is a professor in Ottawa, professor of education, and they took in two women refugees for a certain period of time until they could get an apartment uh, to, uh, to, to fend for themselves. And I think that as a society and as people like you with this wonderful, wonderful education that we have to stand up to be counted and to do, uh, and to do more. We live in very difficult times. I don't talk about politics, but we do have to stand up and be counted. And, and, and also to be realistic. That reali realism I learned from my background in Nazi Germany, where the German Jews did not think that anything bad would happen. So I think that all of us together have to work more with the United Nations, with all of those organizations that uh, take care of things. And it's very, very sad for me to see that history is repeating itself. Very sad. Thank you. Doctor. Yes? And I wanted to give you an e easy question. Um, you've talked a lot about the first six years being so important in a child's life. Yes. What do you recommend for someone, a child that didn't have a good six years? How do you mm -hmm. break this cycle? How do you okay. um, encourage that child? Fantastic question, because the first thing to say is to say, okay, that child didn't have the luxury of loving parents or good upbringing. There were horrible things happening, whatever it was. Go for help. Uh, it's not uh, anything to be ashamed of, to stand up and say, I need professional help. I need to talk to a therapist, I need to talk to a counselor, I need to talk to what all of you are going to be, like I told you, significant other. I need to talk to somebody so I can put those bad experiences, whatever they are, aside and, uh, and go on from there. And that holds true if you see any of your classmates or anybody who is in trouble to make sure to say there's help available. Don't just wait until horrible things happen. If you see somebody's in trouble for whatever reason, for a love affair going wrong, for somebody dying, anything that is not um, uh, to their liking, to say, go for help. Don't, don't just sit there and despair. I'm sure that you have mental health people here. We have many options, yes. And it is not, a sh that's the important message, that it's not something to be ashamed to, be, uh, to go for help. I have to tell you one more story. At West Point, when I taught the course, I learned something, that military people like you, that the, the big shots and the, the generals, when they come home, um, so they have been away for a while. The wife, in those cases, made all the decisions. And then the big shots come home, and the wife says, take the garbage out. So there is something to be trained for coming back home to, uh, be, uh, to not having saluted, being saluted. So you have to talk about that. That has to do also with some of the knowledge that you are learning. 
Looks like we're Good. almost out of time, so we have a few more minutes for maybe these two questions. So if we want to try and get those in before we wrap up. Good morning, Dr. Ruth. Hello. Um, I have a personal question for you. Uh, first, I want to comment on the amount of positivity radiating from a 90-year-old woman. Um, I think me, unlike or like the rest of people, are astonished by it. Um, living in a world of negativity as a child, what tools did you use to combat the fear to help push you through that, and how did you motivate others as well? I think in my particular case, the importance was that I came from a religious background. And, and even so, I did say, how can God permit such atrocities to happen, which is the same question that we can still ask today. I did have the foundation of saying that uh, what we have to do is to try to make the best of it. And, and uh, not to dwell, but I always say, when I did my first autobiography, I said I need to go to a therapist. I need to discuss my early childhood experiences, the horror of seeing the Nazis taking my father, the knowledge that my whole family was uh, not alive anymore. I need to discuss that with a professional in order to be able to write the book. And I did that. So you have to kind of talk to yourself, saying it is nothing to be ashamed of by going for help. Do we have time for this last question? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, that is the last question. Um, uh, thank you again. On behalf of our 2018 NCLS participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty, and staff of the Air Force Academy, we would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Okay, all of you, when you come to Washington Heights to visit me, I, you will see that I'm putting it in my living room. Thank you so very much. Thank you.